Hello everyone, and welcome back, at long last, to Decades. Today, my friends, we return to the Peak District, where we're joined by Jones, who was all too eager to show us his conversion to the faithful of the beloved Nissan Micra. And today, we're heading part of the way along Snake Pass, one of the most dangerous roads in the UK. Known for blind summits, twisty bends, hazardous conditions and inclement weather, and the devil on your shoulder encouraging you to be silly. But that's not the focus of today's video, as I have no intent on meeting my maker on a portion of the A57. However, a short hike from a lay-by along this portion of the A57, you might just happen upon something truly fascinating. As up on Bleaklow, the second highest point in the county of Derbyshire, surrounded by gorgeous, glorious moorland, we can happen upon the lonely, exposed wreckage of a plane. A United States Air Force RB-29A superfortress known as the Overexposed. But what's the story of this glorious machine, and how did it come to rest here, in beautiful old Derbyshire? And what's the significance of this site for the area? These are questions I'm hoping to answer in today's video. But first, let's talk a bit about the plane. The Boeing B-29 Superfortress was one of the largest aircraft to see use during the Second World War. A four-engine, propeller-driven heavy bomber succeeding the B-17 Flying Fortress. The Super Fortress was chiefly used by the United States both during World War II and the Korean War. This plane came to be when the Flying Fortress was deemed inadequate for the Pacific Theater. Needing a bomber that could carry a larger payload for thousands of miles, Boeing would get to work developing pressurized long-range bombers. The expensive development of the Super Fortress resulted in the B-29 sporting state-of-the-art technology, a pressurized cabin, analog computer-controlled machine gun turrets, and dual-wheeled tricycle landing gear, at an expense significantly greater than that of even the Manhattan Project. The B-29 would become the most expensive project of the war. The B-29's maiden flight took place on the 21st of September 1942, and before long these bombers became known as the most advanced of the Second World War, capable of flying faster, farther and at higher altitudes than any other plane in its class, all while providing the crew with the comfort of pressurisation for the first time in a bomber. Though I'm glossing over the illustrious history of the B-29s a fair bit, their most famed or infamous usage, depending on how you view it, came at the end of the Second World War when two American B-29 superfortresses named Enola Gay and Boxcar would drop the atomic bombs Little Boy and Fat Man respectively over Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan, the only instances of nuclear weapon usage in warfare. The Overexposed, also known by some today as the Bleaklow Bomber, was a Boeing B-29 Superfortress designated RB-29A-446-1999, modified for reconnaissance purposes for the 16th Photographic Reconnaissance Squadron of the United States Air Force, and was fitted with a multitude of state-of-the-art cameras. The Overexposed would fly in July of 1946 during Operation Crossroads, photographing test detonations of nuclear weaponry at the coral reef of Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands. The plane would also participate in the Berlin Airlift in 1948, delivering supplies to sectors of Berlin under Western control amidst the Soviet blockade. As for how the plane found itself here, over 600 metres above sea level on the higher shelf stones east of the market town of Glossop in the high peak borough of Derbyshire, it was on a routine flight between RAF Scampton, Lincolnshire, and a US Air Force base in Burton Wood, Cheshire, accompanied by two other aircraft during the morning hours of the 3rd of November 1948. 
aboard the overexposed, there were 13 personnel. Captain Landon Tanner, the pilot. Captain Harry Stroud, the co-pilot. Sergeant Ralph Fields, the engineer. Sergeant Charles Wilbanks, the navigator. Sergeant Gene Gartner, the radio operator. Sergeant David Moore, the radar operator. Sergeants Saul Banks, Donald Abregast, Robert Doyle, along with Private William Burroughs, who comprised the overexposed's camera crew, and Captain Howard Keel, a photographic advisor, along with two passengers, Corporals George Ingram Jr. and Clarence Franson. When the plane failed to arrive at Burton Wood, the RAF Mountain Rescue Service, who had a team already on a training exercise on the Kinder Scout Moors not too far to the south, would be sent to search for the missing plane. The RAF Harper Hill Rescue Team would venture to Bleaklow, locating the overexposed at 4.30pm. The aircraft was smashed across a large debris field with only the tail section intact. Sadly, there were no survivors, beginning the task of piecing together what happened. It's believed the overexposed passed over the area here around 11am. A low cloud had made navigation difficult, resulting in the flight crew flying by instrument alone. Due to low visibility and poor weather conditions adding more confusion to navigation, the piloting crew believed they had passed the hills by some distance, and the overexposed began its descent, dropping beneath the clouds, immediately hitting the ground and erupting into a blaze resulting in all 13 men aboard the plane perishing on impact. And according to this plaque found at the site of the wreckage, it's believed they never even saw the ground. The remains of the occupants would be collected and taken to Burton Wood, along with the over $7,000 in wages intended for delivery to the airbase that was aboard the plane. As for the remains of the plane itself, the overexposed was largely left up here exposed to the elements, as removing all debris was likely deemed impractical. Some portions of the plane were removed from the site, and of course over the decades I'm sure many small pieces of the wreckage have gone missing, as I've seen and heard anecdotal accounts of people taking souvenirs, but the rest remains as a memorial to the men who died here, and should be respected as such. Interestingly, the overexposed wasn't the only plane to run afoul of Bleak Low. In fact, it was the seventh. Between 1939 and 1956, eight planes have crashed on this peat-covered gritstone moorland. In fact, both in and around the Peak District in general, there are well over 100 plane wreck sites apparently. I couldn't find the specific number. Wild moors are notorious for rapid weather changes, which likely didn't help matters. The B-29 Superfortress known as the Overexposed, otherwise known as the Bleaklow Bomber Crash Site, is perhaps the most famous wreckage in the region, and it's quite something to stand amongst, though one should point out the obvious hazards. So if you're fancying a visit, please bear that in mind. On that note, the site isn't very well signposted, nor is there a clear path to the wreck. At first it may seem that way, but very quickly you'll find yourself without a path traversing across moorland, only having the footprints of other visitors to guide you. At various points you'll need to scramble and climb in order to reach the wreckage, as well as navigate soft ground, uneven surfaces, streams and so on. And though there is a trick point nearby to the wreckage, it isn't what I'd consider an accessible place. Furthermore, moorland isn't to be travelled lightly. If you plan on visiting, go prepared with plentiful water, warm clothing, appropriate footwear and so on, and aim for visiting during the summer months where the days are longer and the weather is a tad more reliable. Avoid being caught up on the moor when night falls and make sure to keep your bearings at all times. Tread mindfully when off the path. Though it's hardly the worst mooch I've undertaken, the terrain is tricky and without landmarks for the most part, so go prepared and wait for ideal conditions for the easiest time. Provided you go prepared, the trip can be rewarding, the scenery is beautiful, the history of this plane is fascinating, and it's days out like this that I wish I could do more of, and we shall in time. Nevertheless, that brings us nicely to the end of this video, which is the first video I've published on this channel 
in a couple of months. I apologise for that. But thank you all for watching anyway. I really hope that you've enjoyed today's little day out. Hopefully there'll be more content to come in the near future. And we hope to see you all then. But until next time, please take care and goodbye.